ja ma paluks siia siis paneel sessioonil osalajad istuma ja nii kaua mina siis lisan mõned sellised korralduslikud aspektid. Et esimene korralduslik aspekt on, et tõenäoliselt siia nüüd lähiajal kuvatakse ekraanile üks QR-kood, mille te võite siis avada ja see on süsteem, mille kaudu te saate tegelikult reaal ajas esitada küsimusi, mida me siis vaatame ja proovime vastata. Ja samuti küsimusi võib kogu aeg esitada ka selle sessiooni käigus, sest üks meie sessiooni paneeli liikmete sellised põhiseisukohti oli, et see peaks olema selline väga interaktiivne, dünaamiline, kõik peaksid olema kaasatud, et siin ei ole sellest loengut, vaid et see on ka asja sisu, et kui keegi tahab midagi küsida või kommenteerida, siis palun seda tehke. Kolmas on seotud keelega. Et pigem võib-olla veidikene viimasel hetkel selgus, et sellel aastal meil ei ole sünkroontõlke võimaluste, aga me oleme lahendanud selle niimoodi arvestades seda, et meil on kolleegid Leedust, kes ilmselgelt eesti keelt ei oska ja nendega me peame suhtlema inglise keeles ja ma tean, et kuulajaskonna ulgas on inimesi, kellele võibolla inglise keele ei ole igapäevane ja et see oleks selge ja aru saadav, siis osa sessioonist on inglise keeles, aga doktor Nevevent on olnud nii lahke, kes siis võtab selle nii-öelda mõtte sellest ingliskeelsest diskussioonist ja kuvab ka jällegi reaal ajas siia ekraanile, nii et inimesed siis näevad, milles see jõud käib. See ei ole nüüd päris absoluutne 100%-iline sünkroontõlge, aga anname endast parima ja osa diskussioonist on ka eesti keeles. Ja teie võite oma kõik oma küsimusi küsida eesti keeles ja vastame ka eesti keeles, kui see ei ole just meie leedu kolleegidele mõeldud küsimus. Okay, I will shift to English now, sorry. <laughs> so I'm really honored to welcome here today uh, uh, patients and pa patient representatives, some of them presenting patient organizations, uh, some of them kindly sharing their uh, personal experience, and I'm grateful to you all. And we will, within the time given to us, uh, which is short enough, try to uh, discuss why and how should cancer patient actually be involved in health and healthcare related issues, what's the obstacles, what's the opportunities, uh, maybe in a personal level, national level, maybe also international level. And maybe this is the meeting point also for Estonian patients and patient representative organizations. We have already seen it already today, uh, people meeting uh, to upgrade the current situation maybe, and, and for the cancer patient, uh, for the voice of cancer patients more to be uh, heard also here. Okay, but uh, to start with, um, uh, maybe each of you would give a really short overview or introduction, who you are, uh, where do you come from, and uh, why are you here today, what do you think? <laughs> yes, you can start from here. Okay, Tere, <laughs> it's loud. Okay. Yeah, it's loud, it's strange. Is, is it Tere or Terre? Tere. Okay, in between. Uh, I'm Sharunas, coming from Lithuania. I'm living with a type of leukemia, so I'm cancer patient for 18 years. I was diagnosed when I was 18, and since then I started my advocacy. And uh, just fast forward, uh, I think today I wear three hats related to the patient advocacy, because in Lithuania I was a president for a decade of the organization, which is now the biggest patient organization in the country, called Lithuanian Cancer Patient Coalition. So Neringa is director there, so I'll stop there. She will maybe tell more about that organization. I'm also co-founder and chairman of a European organization for young people with cancer, that's called Youth Cancer Europe. And at global level, it's also for the people that have the same diagnosis as me. It's called CML Advocates Network. CML is chronic myelogenes leukemia. So I know we, we are some prominent hematologists in the room and in the panel here as well, uh, who I actually got to interact in, in some EMA sessions, European Medicines Agency. So that global organization is quite unique in itself because it's a rare disease, but we have over 130 member organizations from 96 countries and all continents except Antarctica. Uh, and this organization has been um, going on for 20 years. So. Uh, 
few years before I was diagnosed, my disease was still considered as a death, can uh, death sentence. It was back in 2006. And now the people living with my disease have the same life expectancy as a healthy human being. Um, so that's a reality for me. I'm still not in remission. I still take medicine every day, still the same medicine that I started taking 18 years ago. And it's likely that I will have to do it uh, for whole well, life. Um, so, and I hope I still have many more years to live. And that means I have to be involved in healthcare system. I have to understand how it works. It impacts my life. It impacts uh, not just health elements, but social elements. It impacts my personal life, fertility, and etc. It impacts the, the way you can uh, be uh, either active in society and contribute and, and you know, pay taxes to economy, or if you are not enabled, then you are becoming a disabled person and relying on the social benefits. So that's my life journey related to patient advocacy. Out of that, I do other things, but that, this is not what today is about. Yes, he's a lawyer. Uh, so, Christina, some words about yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm an oncologist. I'm, I'm not a patient or a patient advocate here. So I'm, I'm here to facilitate the discussion afterwards. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm also head of uh, hematology oncology clinic in Tartu University Hospital. And um, while we're discussing with patient issues here, it's, it's, um, it's due to the fact that everything we do, we do for patients. And if... Um, we don't know what the patients really need or want, so it, it, it won't be a good service from us. So uh, I think that the input from patients to cancer care is extremely important, and we hope that all patients and patient um, families actually will be more and more involved in, in what we're doing. Tere, mina olen Siiri Rannama. Esindan Saareme vähiühingut ja meie väike vabatahtlikusel põhinev organisatsioon tegeleb patsientide, vähipatsientide ja nende lähedaste huvi kaitsega. Ja lisaks igapäeva tööle on meil olnud võimalus osaleda Eesti riikliku vähitõrjeplaani välja töötamises ja täna kuulume töörühma, mis kaardistab kopsuvähi ja patsiendi raviteekonda ja koos tervise kassaga tegeleme praegu rindade enesevaatluse klippi ja infomaterjalide välja töötamisega. Tere, mina olen Merik Käverik ja minul oli vähk 14 aastat tagasi. Ma olen ise ka patsient ja samas nõustan ma ka vähiühingus patsiente ja olen ka regionaalaiglas 12 aastat nõustanud vähipatsiente. See on väga suur kogus inimesi, kes on oma murega minu pole pöördunud. Et Põhja-Eesti vähihaigete ühendusest teen ma Hea, tegevus, hea tegevuslikult juba ka 12 aastat iga teisipäev üritusi, et patsientidele jõuaks teaduspõhine informatsioon ja nad saaksid ka üksteisega tuttavaks ja üksteiselt tuge ning lektorid on tavaliselt meil ka sarstid või omala diplomeeritud spetsialistid ka nendelt siis abi. Et iga kevadel näiteks käivad meil lümfiterapeudid rääkimas, et inimesed teaksid hoiduda ja ennast mitte vigastada. Et pean väga oluliseks seda, et, et ravi oleks, kuna mul endal on geneetiline vähk, siis olen väga suur personaalmeditsiini poolde ja suhtun väga väga hästi sõeluuringutesse ja leian, et see on üli-üli vajalik. Ja nagu siin eeskõnele just rääkis sellest meeste eesnärme vähist, et väga oluline on see, et sulle tuleb kutse koju ja või telefonile või kõige parem, kui see tuleb su telefonile, et sa märkad seda ja et sa, see tekitab su selle tund, et ah, ma pean minema. Selle pärast, et siiski arst on meile kõige olulisem ja kui arst kutsub, siis tavaliselt ikkagi minnakse. Ja, ja ka need bukletid on olulised Selle pärast, et kui patsient on väga raskelt aige ja võtab selle bukleti kaasa, siis ta kodused ja lähedased näevad ka seda trükkimaterjali, et seda ei tasuks ka ala innata. Et tegin kohe väikse kokkuvõtte, nüüd palun edasi. 
Terve Eest, minu nimi on Annika Uudaläppi, ma kõigepealt tahaksin teada, et paljud tegelikult tunneb siin saalist mugavalt inglise keelt kuulates. Et olge kena tõstke käed, kellel on lihtne inglise keelest aru saada. On umbes 10-15 inimest, kelle käed ei tõusnud. Et see natukene teeb raskeks. For me, it is actually the same whether I speak in Estonia or in English. Maybe I'll do the introduction yeah. in Estonia and then the discussion can be further in, in, uh, in the other language. Mind kutsus Dr. Kõrgvesi ja sellepärast, et, et mina olen vähipatsiendi pereliige olnud, kes on saanud suure osa oma ravist mitte Eestis. Et natuke nagu rahvusvahelist kogemust tuua patsiendi vaates, et minu abikaasa on tänaseks nelja aastat lahkunud. Ta on 45 aastalt diagnoositi viimasest staadiumis kopsuvähk ja ta neli, elas sellega neli aastat. Ja suure osa tema ravist, me elasime Prantsusmaal, Pariisis ja minul oli endal kogemus siis küll külja kõrval tema ka olles ja, ja kõik need raviasutused läbi käies kuues eri haiglas. Ta läbis praktiselt kõik vähiravi meetodid, mida oli võimalik üldse teha. Tal oli kaks täpisravi liini, medikamentoosen süsteemne ravi, tal oli üldkiiritusravi, tal oli stereotaktiline kiiritusravi pärast, pärast ajumetastaasi operatsiooni, mis siis toimus Prantsusmaal, selja operatsioon, ehk kaks operatsiooni, üldkiiritusravi, stereotaktiline täpiskiiritusravi ja, ja samuti ka see tavaline üld kemoteraapia, eks ole kui täpisravi meid ära meie nii et üsnagi laia spektri kogemus ja seda toon natuke siia ja erialaselt mina küll ei ole meedik, aga olen töötanud ühes meditsiiniasutuse juhtkonnas kaks aastat, nii et natukene on ka seda kogemust, et kuidas seal päriselt masina värgis asjad käivad. Thank you. Hello, I'm Njeringa, Njeringa from the Fenian Cancer Patient Coalition, which is an umbrella organization. And uh, it's a bit different umbrella organization from others because we unite not just a number of organizations, we have a 40 of them uh, providing a care for cancer patients. And also we have a huge community of cancer patients. In Lithuania, we have uh, more than 100,000 cancer patients, and almost half of them are our community members. How do we become a community members? When we get ill, we can ask for a membership, and membership is connected with Polacard. Polacard is an instrument for them to provide, to help to receive a financial aid, which is not just like uh, money, but we receive a different discounts in various places with Polo Card, as well in the public transportation. And another thing, we provide contacts to, to us. And when we do have their contacts, we have a channel how to connect to them, how to provide information to them, how to engage them in the treatment process, and how to provide more instruments for them to getting to getting well. So that's why I say that we are strange organizations. We do not have a substitute, uh, a, a diff how to say, a, a like one. We do not see a like one organization as us. As, as Sharuna said, we are the biggest patient organization in Lithuania, and we act in different areas. A huge area is patient advocacy. We are members in different public bodies, in the commissions, in the working party, parties, we provide our insights and comments to the legal acts. And as well, we provide a lot of uh, educational activities for cancer patients and the family members. We provide uh, more than 20 different, uh, different uh, uh, seminars a year. We provide, we send uh, uh, emails to our community almost on a daily basis and what is interesting but, but, that everyone is getting a little bit furious about it. We say, how often do we send letters? We say, almost daily. And everyone says, it's a huge amount. Why do you, that, why do, you do so? But we answer with, uh, with a thing that almost half of people open letters. That's why it's, this shows how it's important for people to get the 
how to say, an important information for them because we do not send just anything about anything. It's everything related with their treatment, with their quality of life, with a new, maybe new, new um, regulations or about uh, some new educational material. And uh, I started in Poland as a volunteer. It was 10 years ago, and it was very interesting to see how organization changes. Because in the beginning, it was just few volunteers and none employees. And now we have 10 employees and 200 volunteers. So, and with the resources, you can act in the different areas. And while you are few, so every board meeting was, start, was starting and ending that we have lots of do so, but who will do? And everyone gets exhaust, exhausted. And nowadays the situation is different, but it's a huge pathway during the 10 years that we, we are able to go and how we are willing to share our experience. Thank you so much. I think we, we have a really nice uh, mix of experiences here, from here and from your perspective, and it seems that uh, we, we might have quite some things in common and some things to, to learn maybe from each other. So my first question actually would go to Sarunas. Who actually is patient advocate? That's easy and a difficult answer. Easy is someone who advocates for the rights of patients, so who defends patients' rights. Now, in a not so easy way, because the area is very wide. So when you consider a patient, uh, you say you're a patient advocate, so what does it mean? The same as you say a doctor, and you are so many specialties. Or if you say healthcare professional, that's even broader, right? It goes beyond the doctors. So the same because there are so many areas of health, and all of these areas have to do with patients, so you can be active in that area or not. And this is a huge map. Uh, so if I would just say, as a patient advocate, you don't need to be in every area. Same as a doctor is not expert in every area of a healthcare system. Uh, but what could be that? Understanding the medicines, how we are, you know, from research and development to a way how we are being approved and reimbursed and then dispensed and reported. So let's say medical pathway, uh, sorry, medicines uh, pathway. Then you can be uh, really involved into the healthcare delivery, how it is being organized. So, you know, wh what can you help uh, at the family doctor level or what you can do at university uh, level with the waiting times, uh, with navigating the patients and, and other cares. Uh, there is overarching layer of that that the, the legal laws are regulating all of this. So you need to be at least able to understand what's changing because on one side healthcare systems are one of the most inert systems out there it's the legal system and the health system and in the health system when you're regulating you regulate with legal system so very inert but on the other side because there are so many breakthroughs which are happening in order for the breakthrough the new therapy the new surgery the new algorithm to be available for your patients, it has to be regulated. So you need to keep a, a bit uh, mind of that. And uh, if that's not complicated enough, then there's all of the social domain. This is what we called about the quality of life for the cancer patient and for the care. It is a social uh, domain in terms of psychological uh, care, uh, financial support, logistics, how to get from place to place. Uh, and actually, I think in, in Estonia, you are in a good position because you have one ministry for health and social affairs. We have two uh, separate in Lithuania. And because we are two, they often compete. They say, it's not our problem, it's their problem, or it's, and then it becomes no one's problem because, of course, funding is the issue. Uh, and uh, just now, that before the session, we were explaining, uh, uh, I was explaining a bit that when you don't see this as a continuum of a patient journey, uh, what patient has to go through. So if you see healthcare system separate to the social system, uh, you are creating a lot of fragmentation for one, and that means efficiencies in terms of time, in uh, human resources. And I gave this example. Think of this hotel. If you come to this hotel, and then you want to go to the conference room, but there is no one to guide you. 
Okay, you come and you want to find. So you go to elevator, you keep pressing buttons. You go to the 10th floor, and the 10th floor says it's not there. Go somewhere else. You go to the lobby. In lobby, you see someone is at the bar. You go to the bar. We say, I don't know. Go ask in the reception. You go ask in the reception. They say the second floor. Then do you take a stairs? Do you take the elevator? What do you do? You go there and uh, can you enter? It's polite, not polite, all of this, you see? These are things in a hotel, we see that it's a bit of like someone thought of it, that it's a part of a journey. So same of a patient. If a patient wants to receive a service from his country through the tax money that he is paying to get that service, someone has to think that, okay, how do we guide patient? Because if she just says, oh, you need to go to the doctor, which doctor, when? Okay, waiting time is what, one month, six months? Uh, I need some, some help now, what can I do? And then separately, you can get some financial support. From where? From the country level, from the municipality level, from what, NGO? Who do I need to speak? So these are the contact details online. Where online? Is it a phone? Is it a, a WhatsApp? Is it, uh, is it a chatbot? Where do I go? So if you leave all of this to find the patient or the carer who are already overwhelmed with a problem, they have a problem. You know, do you think the people who have problems, they are generally more happy or they are more frustrated? You can answer it for yourselves. And if you don't help them, this adds to frustration and this leads to even more inefficiencies. So it's counterproductive not to do so. Uh, and, you know, I can be going on and on and on in this continuous journey. But I think what is important to understand, and it is our modus operandi in patient advocacy, it's not just mine, it's not just Lithuania, Everyone understands that stakeholders in the system, doctors, nurses, psychologists, uh, municipality, uh, people who work at municipality level, at a ministry, at a payer institution, they are all partners in this. And the, if you are discussing something which has to do with your health, all of these parties have to be involved. It is also the saying at Europe, which is uh, very old, like 30 years old, that we in cancer patient advocacy, we say nothing about us without us. Nothing that concerns us should be discussed without us contributing or saying if it's good or not. At the end of the day, this is what healthcare system is intended to help the patient. So why don't you listen to the patient? But it's not just saying that patient is always right because we cannot be experts in every field, same as doctor is not expert in this field, same as policy maker is not expert in what patient feels. And this is the, what, why we have a democracy, why we have a social dialogue. So if we are starting with this and coming with an approach that every perspective is appreciated, I mean, I can be just uh, citing you a lot of scientific research focused on diversity and inclusion, meaning that the more different voices you get, the better outcome is. The faster you innovate, the faster you are successful, everyone is more uh, pleased. Uh, so, it's just a rule of thumb to do. However, of course, we have a cultural, uh, let's say, trauma in, in a post-Soviet time. We don't have a, uh, the, the culture of working together. We have a lot of barriers, but these have to be taken gradually. In these conferences, you are listening what is happening somewhere else. From my position, I think that you in Estonia, you already have a higher mentality than we have in Lithuania. I do not know why, it's my personal perception. I think that you are more able to help each other. You're coming with a less suspicious approach when you interact. I mean, you are laughing at this, but I think at Lithuania we have a saying, when Lithuanian is happy, when he sees that his neighbor's roof is on fire. That, that is our mantra, right? So I do, I do believe that you're in a better situation, so I think there is definitely what you can do by talking together. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, just to summarize shortly, patient advocate is somebody who helps the patient and the family to navigate through the health system and is the voice of the patients in a national, legislational, whatever level. So, there are lots of functions that you actually can have and you can work at the hospital helping just patients or with the governments or with the pharma companies uh, to, uh, to, to address the issues that are important to you. Merike? Et selle kommentaariks ma tahaks öelda, et meil põhjaregionaal aiglas on paljatiivravikeskus ja seal on võimalik saada 
psühholoogi abi, ingeoidi abi, valuravi arsti abi, valuravi õde töötab seal, et see on väga oluline ja see saigi just tehtud selleks, et neid probleeme lahendada. Ma isiklikult tegin ka filmi, see on YouTubis olemas, palliatiivravi keskus. Te võite seda jagada, te võite ise seda vaadata ja oma patsientidele soovitada. Seal on väga hästi välja toodud mis spetsialiteete seal on võimalik endale paluda ja seal ei ole väga pikad järjekorrad, nii et on võimalik saada psühholoogi teenust, et siin on see, et me peame teadma, mis uksest sisse minna ja kuhu elistada ja see palliatiivravi keskuse number on 617177, et sinna võib alati elistada ja küsida nõu ja seal on need abid olemas ja kui ma Peale seda, kui ma sain selle vähidiagnoosi, siis ma läksin oma kolmandat kõrgaridust omandama Tallinna tervise koju kõrgkooli ja uurisin natuke, et kuidas, kuna see teema mind ennast nii puudutas, siis uurisin, et kuidas mojal maailmas neid asju lahendatakse. Ja näiteks John Hopkins siis on õdenõustaja ja see õdenõustaja, ma tegin ka ühe töö sellel teemal, see õdenõustaja on ise ka vähikil läbipõdend inimene ja kes omab ka meditsiinilisi teadmisi ja selle juurde on sellel patsiendil väga hea minna, ta saab sellist informatsiooni, et kuidas siis on keemiaraviga, mis ma pean edasi tegema, kuidas ma pean käituma, need on hästi olulised asjad ja hästi oluline on see, et arsti jõuaks sellele patsiendile otsa vaadata Ja et patsient saaks ta käest need küsimused küsida, et see esmane vastuvõttu aeg peab olema pikk ja järgmine see 15 minutit on ka, see on väga lühik aeg. Patsient, kes on segaduses, ta soovib informatsiooni ja seda ei tohi ala innata. Oma arst on kõige-kõige tähtsam ja need teised uksed peavad olema sellele patsiendile avatud, sellepärast, et kui ta saab just nii nagu siin normes rääkis, et kui see patsient saab selle diagnoosi, ta on täiesti segaduses, ta ei saa aru, ta ei saa aru, ta ei saa isegi lihtsamatest asjadest aru ja ta ei mõista sellist teaduslikku keelt, et et ma alati, noh, palun, et kirjutage paperi peale ja paluga arstil, et ta teile lihtsas keeles seletaks, sest ta, et nad tulevad minu jõust ütlevad, ma ei saanud mitte midagi aru. Ja see on see, see, nagu see, kuidas sõelda, võlusõna ja ma osalesin ka vähipatsientide teekonna disainimisprojektis. Aga hees korra hakkime sellest pärast poole, et me korra kõsulme siit vahelt veel natukene. Et actually, I wanted to ask Nerenga, what exactly, in what, which processes in Lithuania you as a patient advocate has been involved? And what are your main achievements? You can uh, share with the uh, Sharun also. Mm -hmm. What exactly have you been doing and achieving uh, in your country? It's lots of areas. <laughs> For example, it, it, it's, it's good to base on examples last year, what we did last year. Last year, normally, how do we proceed? One area of our activities is surveys. We ask opinion of cancer patients and basing on their opinion or insights, we do provide some recommendations for the uh, stakeholders, for the ministries or parliament. For example, last year we provide one survey about the incontinence. Because normally in Lithuania we do have a system which is already in force about 10 years that people who are suffering from incontinence we can receive these diapers free of charge. And our surveys showed that half of them, half of people, half of cancer patients, we do not know that we have this ability to, to, to receive the compensations either due We do not know why the, the doctors do not prescribe for them this medicine uh, equipment. And what we done, we went for the, our institutions, uh, explained the problem, we also provided the, asked the media, and the result was that more people found about this problem. We started asking doctors and also the, the, our Lugonukasa, 
uh, National Health Insurance Fund. Yeah, and our it National is. Health Insurance Fund, which is responsible for this system of reimbursement, we provide we provided a series of infographic, and we asked the articles in the national media to be published, explaining who is who is uh, able to receive a compensation in what amount and things like that. This is one example. Let me get another one, and you think of the next one, so okay. we can do one by one. So, but before context, Neringa mentioned how many members we have. So, 50,000 cancer patients receive a free benefit from Polar every month. So, we need to acknowledge this. These are not passive people. We use the discount system. We also provide them free psychological support, free legal advice, second opinion, what else, physical uh, physiotherapy. And uh, one of this example is that uh, as of this year, the oncopsychology care is included. I don't know if it's launched yet or going to be in, in a few months, doesn't From matter. First of July. Uh, uh, first of July. So that it would be paid by National Health Insurance Fund. But how did we get to that? We knew that, you know, if you would just ask the policymakers to do this, you will not get anywhere. Because first you need to create a demand. So the patients, when we don't have access to this, they go to just any uh, psychology in private practice, right? And then it is an issue because you may end up with good psychology, it's not so good, you don't know if they have specialty in oncology or no. So what we started to do, because we were paying for this as an organization, so we pay for that service to the psychologist that we consider are qualified, so we pay for that time, but the patient doesn't pay anything, zero. Patient or a carer doesn't pay anything. That is also the, the one, one of the ways we work. It's not the right or wrong way, it's just how we work. That everything that we do for, pay, for patients, they do not pay anything, it's zero for them. It is also has limitations, I would say. Sometimes you need to, if people contribute something, they are more eager to join the webinar, get that information, use that information, separate discussion. But we were paying for these consultations. And as such, when the Lithuanian University of Health Sciences created a master program for psychologists to specialize in cancer care, then they had this, uh, you know, a, a career perspective that, oh, look, someone maybe works with the children, maybe autism children, someone works with, uh, you know, car accident and traumas and mental diseases as a psychologist. So we can specialize in cancer. And it's a huge domain because it does not affect just the patient, it affects everyone around the patient. Uh, and then this is where uh, the pressure built on and then we actually tried it, we see it as a best practice and now finally the government is taking it over when there is an ecosystem created. So it is one of the examples that what we also do not maybe always successfully, but we try to have a roadmap. If we start doing something today, where, what do we want to achieve with this? As a growth mindset, we do not think everyone will be understanding the problem that we're going to be discussed today in a webinar about the prostate cancer, for instance. But we know if we keep discussing in a webinar about prostate cancer, we can be then going in the difficult, more different topics uh, about maybe metastatic prostate cancer, about erection dysfunction, then about sexual health in between family. And then you grow this, you know, you, you do not do it overnight. But if you work on that way, uh, way, few years down the line, you will see impressive results. And it's not that you can rush it. And because in cancer we have, in cancer area, it's more than 200 different diseases and there is so much to do, and it is impossible to do everything. But if we just start like planting seeds in different areas, it takes time, but they grow. And when we grow, we just need to nurture them a bit, and then we see the results. So what are the examples? So I think I will switch now to Estonia, Siri. Yeah. Do, what, do you think, uh, what do you think, what's the situation currently in Estonia? So what are, what's the state of art? Are there any challenges, opportunities? Mm. Yes. Ta võid vastata Eesti keeles, if you want. Jaa. Ja. <laughs> Eestis on tervises väga suur ebavõrdsus. Baseerub sool haridusel sissetulekule elukohal ja nii edasi. Ja digitaalsel kirjaoskusel või, või siis oskamatusel jälle sõltuvalt vanusest. Me oleme vähiravis samamoodi väga erinevates kohtades, et, et ma saan rääkida Saarema situatsiooni. 
Meie haigla võitles saarlaste eest tublisti ja, ja koos Ida Tallinna keskaiglaga täna Keemeravi Kurasere haiglas toimub, küll aga ei ole asjad sugu kui mitte hästi palliatiivi ja hospiitsraviga. Ja mitte sellepärast, et, et saarlased seda ei tahaks või ei vajaks, või teil kõige sellepärast, et äh, ütleme siis äh, nii, et seadusruum, õigusruum, äh, kus meie maakondlikud haigad täna toimetavad, on ajale väga jalgu jäänud, et äh, meie haiglad äh, pakuvad äh, inimestele erinevaid tervisoju teenuseid äh, ja peavad seda tehes lähtuma 20 aastat augustest äh, määrustest, kui me mõtleme ainult paar aastat tagasi, kui Eesti tapas covid, kui palju selle ajaga on äh, tervisoju korralduses muutunud, on, on, on oma jagu muudatusi olnud. Mm patsientide ja patsientide organisatsioonide kaasamise koha pealt ma saan öelda, et olukord paraneb üha. Kaasatakse järjest rohkem. Aruteludesse kaasatakse meid samuti järjest rohkem. Küll aga ma pigem näen siin sellist ühepoolset kaasamist, et, et ravimeeskonna liikmed pigem ütlevad, et, 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 et kaasame patsiendi, kaasame tema, tema raviotsustesse, räägime sellest, millist taastus ravida vajab, millist raviks ettevalmistusta vajab, millist infot oma ravi kohtada vajab, aga selline kahepoolne Dialoog jääb, jääb puudulikuks selle pärast, et kui inimene saab vähidiagnoosi või, või kui inimese pereliige saab vähidiagnoosi, siis see, kuidas ta nüüd nii öelda ravi teele siseneb, on väga erinev ja sõltub sellest, kuidas tema vähk avastatakse. Kas see avastatakse juhuleijuna, kas see avastatakse sõeluuringus, kas see avastatakse konkreetsete kaebuste tulemusena. Et see, on, see on väga, väga erinev ja kui ma püüan üldistada, meie organisatsioon on ka pisike ja, ja nii nagu just teil kõnele ja rääkis, et, et vähki on üle 2000 nimetuse, et me saame ka oma, oma väikese ressursiga teha natukene võibolla kopsu vähipatsientide heaks, natukene rinna vähki põdevate naiste heaks, et... Äh, Nüüd mul läks mõte korraks kaduma, ma tahtsin taastusravi juurde... Aa! Ah. <laughs> nii... Esimene selline keeruline aeg inimese jaoks on diagnoosi kahtlusest, diagnoosi kinnitumiseni. Et see, see on valus. Inimene, inimene väga tihti jõuab eriti vaimse tervise kontekstis üsna pahasse kohta ja endale palju paha teha. Ehk, et me ei kasuta täna ära seda aega, mis inimene ootab ja muretseb. Me võiksime juba anda infot oma tervise hoidmise kohta, treenimisvõimaluste kohta, toitumise kohta ja mitte, mitte nii, et, et no nüüd sa kindlasti saad vähidiagnoosi, aga vaatame ennem sulle selle info. Vaid et lihtsalt anda juba see info inimesele, et mida ta saab rohkem oma tervise heaks teha. Teine väga keeruline aeg on, on see periood, mis kestab diagnoosi kinnitumisest ravi alguseni. Ja, ja siin on ka jälle see sama ähm, võibolla... No, Teatud mõttes kasutamata ressursse, et kus me võiksime kuidagi dialoogi tõhustada ja juba näiteks küsida inimese käest, et millised on tema majanduslikku toimetuleku piirangud, millised on tema logistilised probleemid, sest et logistilise probleeme ravile käimisega toovad välja nii Tallinnas näiteks Lasnamäel elavad inimesed kui ka siis Narval või, või Kurasaras elavad inimesed. Milline on tema ähm, vaimne tervis? Võibolla tal on väga keerulised inimsuhted. See kõik kokku mõjutab väga otseselt tema ravi tulemust. Et ma selles mõttes näen, et meil on arenguid, mis on hästi tore. Ja meil on, on väga head võimalused tegelikult vähesega ära tehes patsienti veelgi paremini kaasata. Aga, aga kui sa nüüd ütled, et mina küsin su käest nüüd, et see, kes nagu võibolla saaks alustada millegi tegemist, kus ma peaksin alustama, mida ma peaksin tegema, et läheks paremaks, mis see asi see võiks olla, kust ma ja, saaksin alustada. See, ja, nii hea küsimus. <laughs> <laughs> Sest et siin on ka nii, et patsientorganisatsioonid, meil on Eesti vähilid, kes on siis maakondlik vähipatsientide organisatsioonide nii öelda katus. Maakondlikud patsientorganisatsioonid on sisuliselt vabatahtlikud organisatsioonid ja nende võimekus on väga otseselt seotud sellega, millised on eestvedaja oskused. Millised on eestvedaja tugevused? Ehk et üks soovitus on see, et kindlasti, kindlasti võib-olla võttagi patsientorganisatsioonid ette, 
luua nendega rohkem sidemeid, vaadata kindlasti kokku. No, meil on ju nii palju sellist jälgimist ja, ja, ja analüüside tegemist alati ka kohalike saiglates, et kindlasti ka kohalikud aiglat kaasata lisaks vähiravi keskustele. No seda me kõik juba püüame, et ma ütlesin, et Lõuna Eestis on nüüd nii, et analüüse saab panda ka teiste saiglates, et päev enne või te päev või mitu päeva enne, et kuidas on, noh, sinna me püüame minna, et ja. võimalikult vähe peaks, eks ole viipime aiglas, et, Ota, et kas, kas ma... Sealt on üks küsimus vist, ja. ma võibolla lasen ühe küsimuse vahele ja siis me pärast hakkame vaatama ka neid, mis siia tahvlil on tulnud, ja. <laughs> siia on ka olulisi küsimusi tulnud. There are some questions also on the screen. And we'll Please ask. <laughs> so I know you speak English. <laughs> I, I try to. Uh, thank you. It's it's most interesting and most uh, big work that you do. I have a slight, uh, let's say, humorous question. Uh, you as a representative of patients, I have this problem uh, raising in my head from, from time to time. Uh, for example, how do you figure? I understand first that uh, the cancer patients are quite, let's say, disciplined because the problem uh, on a health is huge. Uh, my question is raised also yesterday, and the question is actually, uh, can a doctor turn to you as a patient organization to ask your help to discipline some of the patients who don't uh, actually follow the orders? I can okay. answer definitely, and should. <laughs> And this is where we, we have uh, numerous cases across different disease areas in cancer. But it is the most successful collaboration because uh, the patient organization is a source of information to the patient and care. It's also a peer, someone with a lived experience to connect. And it's also a partner to the hospital because we all want to help that patient. And the, what is needed, the patient or the care, okay, the patient, he or she has to first see that I need help and I am responsible for my health. Yeah. So I have to be active in this, not just whatever they say, whatever they do. If you do that, then definitely, and then with the shared responsibilities. And there's a numerous uh, instances, that may, I think maybe Neringa could elaborate on this, when maybe some information was not available on the treatment options. And it's not what you doctors have time during, you know, after your working hours on weekends to, to create video or leaflet or whatever. This is what patient organizations are doing, can do, about the webinar instead of educating some or specific issue to a patient, you don't have time during your 15-minute slot that you're already late for the next appointment, uh, and uh, it's just one patient. So why not to organize the webinar when you would take one hour of your time, but you will explain it once, maybe 200 people will join, well, it's that in our case, and then you have recording when someone else asks, look there, you know, I don't need to repeat this every time to you. So there is many areas of synergy, and definitely it, it, it is a partnership, it should be a partnership, and if uh, someone thinks that I can do it uh, as a patient organization without doctors, I can say, they, with confidence and experience, they are wrong. If the doctors think they can treat patients without the help of other peers, I also think and can prove of experience that they get it wrong. So you need to speak with each other. Mm -hmm. And now a question to Annika. Could you please um, elaborate a bit um, about uh, your experience and maybe the differences uh, in Estonia compared to France? What are the major problems for you that we should address as a, a, a group with the same goal, actually. <laughs> yeah, with pleasure. I think Estonian medical system is quite good for the money we have. So I have had the opportunity to, to live in a country where the healthcare funding is almost twice as high as in Estonia of, of GDP. So I, I understand that you get much more. Um, but um, having said that, I would say that maybe the biggest lessons are three lessons I would like to point out. First is that cooperation between healthcare organizations is something Estonia is not doing systematically. Something to learn. Um, we were navigated, not by patient organizations, but by the cancer treatment centers, by the uh, hospitals to the next pit stops, so-called, say, okay, we have a hospital who can do your brain surgery because it is a time critical, there is a doctor, there is a surgeon, and 
and it will be done. And then you get consultation, it is done, you get home, and then your treatment goes on until you have a next issue because of the um, progression, of, progression of a disease. Um, basically, you know that one day um, it's, it's going to end uh, uh, with death. Uh, it's, it's just intreatable. Uh, so you need to go through a number of institutions. What is the issue here in Estonia? And I think it is a systematic problem, but the cooperation between hospitals is not anyhow facilitated or supported. Uh, I very much liked the doctor who's, who was speaking previously that he encourages the patients to look for second opinion. I think this is a fundamental right. And it is actually something which a patient is doing also to adhere more for, for the treatment. So if you are more aware what are the options, you have considered this, this and this, then you can be sure that you are making the right decisions because this can be a matter of life and death for many cases. And actually, when you are more aware, you take more responsibility. And then if you take responsibility, you go along, you are fully engaged and you have much better chances to, to be better off. So. Uh, second opinion and also opportunity for second opinion is something which the medical system should create. And th this is my next point, that it comes from the documentation. If a hospital is not documenting the, the work of the medical committees, conciliums, in a very good manner, this is actually only partially useful. Because wherever you go with your documentations, everybody's asking, okay, please su submit your file. And file means epicrisis, the full story, and also the previous opinions with medical arguments. Why we did choose for this option. I have a personal case of, um, uh, of one Estonian big hospital, which didn't have any single word of uh, uh, epicrisis, uh, making a decision of why brain surgery was considered not possible. And it was the severe mistake in the treatment. I know it because it was possible in another hospital. Yes, it was another country. But I made a call to myself to a neurosurgeon, to another Estonian hospital, and asked, please have a look at this MRI picture. Is it operable? Because we all know that if, as a patient of cancer, you get an information that we are going to operate you, that's time to open champagne, to make some fun. Because this is the best which can happen. Maybe you can rid of this. Uh, at least you have a chance for that. Uh, so the, the other doctor said that, yes, I would, I would operate that, also in Estonia. So I would say that the opportunities for collegial consultation of the best treatment options are so little used. In, uh, in Estonia, in hopefully not in all cases, but in, in my experience. So I really say that please work together, collaboration is everything, and we will be a small country, as Lithuania is a small country. There are so rare cancers that you, and you are doctor working with these cancers on, on a daily basis, but you have nobody to consult even in Estonia. So the only option is to make a network. So I applaud to every doctor who is reading research articles, who is reading and going to conferences of the best available knowledge and a word, who is following all the seminars, webinars online, to just get an understanding where to contact. Doctors are a community worldwide. They do help each other. They give references. Uh, so, cooperation, patient information is a key. My experience from France is that and I think that they have a system for that in the university. And I have talked to Estonian doctors, I mean, tens of conversations with my ex-colleagues, and they said, nobody teaches that to us in our medical practice when we study. And this is how to talk to a patient in a manner that you really understand that patient has got the information. If, you, if you're a medical professional, you are by default using a lot of medical terms. So this is not something patient understands uh, very often, as you mentioned. But also is that my experience from France was that the doctor was looking at my eye and asked, so can you rephrase it for me? What did you hear? So I was actually so softly pushed, very gently, very, uh, I don't know, like friendly manner to explain what did I understand. 
And, um, and then I explained that. And basically, it was a mechanism for the doctor to understand whether I got it right. So it was a feedback for him. It was not a, like an exam. And it was done systematically to whatever kind of hospital we ended up with. We didn't, we didn't know any doctor in France. We were just strangers, just walked in, actually brought in by the ambulance. So, um, as I said, it's the plain language, a very thorough, open, frank, this very even slow communication to a patient of the treatment options, what happens next. And if, if you know as a doctor that maybe we don't have these opportunities right now, you could say that maybe we don't have it, but in a world there are, and patients are moving across the borders in a growing basis. So at least they can make their own decision, saying that, okay, I didn't go for that option. So this responsibility is not on your shoulder as a doctor, but it's on the shoulder of a patient, because he or she is well enough informed to take responsibility and decision. So transparency of the medical documentation and files this is very, very important. Patients are victims if this is not provided. Uh, uh, as I said already, uh, communication of patients and cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. So this is my three maybe key takeaways. Can I just quickly add on it, just very briefly, what you said about preparation? <laughs> yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go for the parliament. <laughs> but uh, w what you said on preparation and understanding, repeating in a lay language, uh, and Paula, this is exactly what we hear uh, often from patients. As such, we created a resource, uh, like a, a two-pager, I don't know how much it is, uh, how to prepare for a visit with a doctor, with a really collection of these uh, tips that we feel Which that was? is very useful. So whoever wants to do something to do that, just contact us, we give you a resource, editable format, translate it and use it. Uh, with pride uh, in terms of uh, prepare the questions in advance, what could be the questions related. Uh, if possible, don't go alone, go with someone uh, when you are in, uh, in your first visits, uh, either when upon the diagnosis or just shortly after. So all of these tips and tricks that we know from the life that help patients to actually understand and on board, and you all know of an issues when it, 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 it's not connect, when the patient doesn't understand what the doctor is saying and is not doing what the doctor is think that patient should be doing. Yes, uh, maybe I will comment. Um, I'm a pediatric hemato-oncologist. I'm on a daily basis so working with rare diseases and lots of patients, or lots of diseases I have never before seen, or I have seen some of them. So uh, in our world, uh, this collaboration is ongoing on a daily basis, basically. Maybe some of you can comment. We are all the time writing, and we, there is a community, a European community, uh, world community, to get the second opinion. And I, the patient numbers are so slow that I have a bit more time to spend with the patient, but I can see my colleagues from adult oncology and hematology. And if you have to see 28 patients, it you would love to do it. You would love to involve, inform, mm -hmm. be there, ask the question, but do, from where do we do, do as a system, as a um, uh, state would take this time, or is it about the money, or is it about the resources? So this is, this is actually the question, maybe some <laughs> representatives uh, from here that we have to think. What are our options within this limited budget and personal things, because most of the doctors, I do believe, would love to, give, to be there for the patient, would love to have this uh, first consultation, as you, as I understood, have achieved for the first uh, consultation one hour for a cancer patient in Lithuania. Was it so? So le let me elaborate on this. We, uh, it's, it's a bit, there's many issues in cancer field, and of course it is uh, like funding's not available for that, and it's also about the splitting of uh, responsibilities in, in this regard. So in, in Europe, we are hearing what is a good standard. The good standard currently in Western countries is nurse explains everything to you. In Lithuania, similar in Estonia, the, the regulators don't think that because the salary difference is not yet there, that the doctor costs 10 
times more expensive than, than the nurse. And therefore, we expect everyone for, uh, on the doctor. And of course, patients always prefer to listen from the doctor, not from the nurse. Mm -hmm. But this is mm -hmm. imminent that this will have to change. Mm -hmm. But there is also the things of technology, what you can do to have the summaries. And uh, I mean, we are always about uh, thinking how to do things more efficiently. But healthcare systems, even the best healthcare systems, have one third of all resources being spent inefficient. Uh, so it's huge wastage, and a lot of that because there are so many interactions with humans and the times of limitation. So when you are saying and you are asking what Paula is doing, so uh, yes, Paula is able to say we have an issue, to mobilize media around it, politicians about it, uh, to pass laws on this, but we, uh, th this is not good enough because I think we have many things that on paper, if you read in Lithuania, we say, oh, really good. But from saying that you do it to actually do it well, it's a very big bridge to cross. And I don't think that there is a single area that we're really good at in, in oncology in Lithuania. So even if you would say something has to be there, uh, and we think it's a success, it is passed, the law is passed, and the funding is allocated, it's not a given that it will be success. So it's constant uh, struggle. And the best thing when you are struggling is to have partners, to you know, not compete with each other, not to think it's, it's uh, my problem, not my problem. What I, I gathered a bit from your agenda, I tried to translate it from Estonia, is that you were dealing with the burnouts, as a community, same in Lithuania, you are dealing with a short waiting, uh, short consultation time, same in Lithuania, I don't know if you are speaking with the waiting times, so that's also of course a very big problem in Lithuania. So all of these things will not go away. So either you are frustrated and then, oh, everything is bad and I will try to emigrate, and when you emigrate, there is no surprise, it's the same problems. And just different maybe approach and solutions. And then you have this shift in mindset that's saying, oh, I can do something about it, but me alone, I cannot change the system. But if I have partners and if I have an ecosystem which is not just thinking that everything is bad, but that we can do something about it, this is how you will get there. So to answer, yes, we have these things that we started and advocate for, and we also have that, uh, I think, the reality is that every oncologist in Lithuania knows about our organization, knows about our Pollock, Card, they tell when the patient is being diagnosed, uh, look to the website, uh, look to the leaflet, or we give like, them the leaflet to show and there. And this is how we save their time. So they don't need to explain everything. And they can say, look, the next time I will be meeting you, maybe in a month, there is resource on the disease and what to do when you are being diagnosed with that specific disease on Polar website, go and read it, and then we can discuss it. So instead of telling it all over again, you can do it smarter if you're aware of, of what's, what is out there, what's possible. And this is extremely important to try to find out uh, or tackle this one third uh, uh, part that yes. we actually could uh, work uh, more efficiently. Just uh, one more question before Christina. Yeah. Uh, from where do you get funding? There was a question. Yeah, yeah. So if you're providing free services and all these kinds, do you have membership? I want Neringa to speak. It's a huge, how to say, it's a huge work done to receive a funding and to remain organization stable, stable financed. Uh, we try to, 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 how to say, to organize our funding from three different sources. And we, our goal is that these three different sources would be a more or less equal. But still, the hugest amount of our funding comes from the different projects. EU, fund EU, EU, EU funding funds. currently, namely EU funding. Okay. Another part is funding from the individual persons. And with funding from the individual persons, the biggest part comes from the this uh, national system that when part of the personal income, personal income tax, every yeah. person selects which NGO it goes to, or if they don't, when we go to church and they go to political parties. Yeah, yeah. So this is another part, and the third one is uh, uh, a funding we receive from the different companies as a corporate assistance. But not just pharma. So no, no. it's actually the pharma is, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, polar pile, the least uh, percentage. So you have other corporations outside of health who just see the work that we do and they want to sponsor logistic firms, printing houses, whatever. 
So can you, before I ask a question from Annika, uh, can, uh, can you elaborate uh, or comment? Uh, I, I think you said once that you have been also, as a patient advocate, working together with the pharma companies, telling them that we as patients need this and this and this. And so this is the level, can you just very shortly describe? So what, what Okay, so th this is, uh, my comment was made in a global level, and I think it's just to show you the impact that the patient advocates can do. So in my disease area, there are now seven targeted therapies uh, uh, on the market. And uh, I think we have been discussing with a pharmaceutical company at a global level with their global people from the moment they thought that it's a good molecule and uh, to, to test, so 15 years before we hit the market, that we were involved systematically in, okay, so in preclinical stage, what the animal studies show, first, uh, um, first stage of clinical trials with the health volunteer, second stage, third stage, then registration, then reimbursement with health technology assessment. And we were there every way and we were criticizing or saying what could be amended. It is quite unique experience in that regard. It's not a given standard, but it shows that it's possible. So so actually, when we, as a, you as a doctor, at your practice are receiving the medicine, the work on that medicine, as you know, has started like 12, 15 years before, from the moment when you know it's good. So this is a huge uh, time gap for the patients and to the doctors to know whether it's good or bad or to do something about it or not do something about it. And uh, like some examples, it's like we managed to switch uh, formulations early on for, being, uh, for medicine to be able to take in without food, uh, not just with food. So you have the fasting periods. With fasting periods, people are less compliant than if you can take it anytime, empty stomach or not empty stomach. So these variations and the strengths of dosages and the combos and just manipulation that could avoid, uh, avert some adverse effects. Yeah, okay. I, I, think I, I really want to comment question. on Please. that. Uh, really, <laughs> both of you, actually, Annika and, uh, and you, Sharunas, that in a, what is the situation in Estonia that uh, I can't say that Anyhow, that patients and doctors do not do any cooperation in, for patients and for a treatment and responsibilities because I'm, a, I'm in the council of the charity fund Gift of Life, actually, and um, daily I actually look for the application for the reimbursement of new drugs that, that are not um, covered by our central sick fund or health fund, what we have right now. So... If, if any of you have ever done this application or be involved in this, or already is one of fan club of this Gift of Life Foundation, actually, if you know that the Gift of Life Foundation have been spent 23 million euros for 10 years for treatment for cancer patients already, uh, so the patients have to take the responsibility that they apply for the treatment, not the doctor, actually. So patients should know what they are applying for, what are their disease, and they make the contract sig signature. They, sig they make, uh, put the signature on the contract. They know the cost of the treatment and everything like that. So this is actually today, this is kind of a bridge between uh, the drugs that, are uh, that will be maybe in the future reimbursed uh, in Estonia and will be available for, uh, for patients, but, uh, but doctors already know that they are good and the patients would benefit for that. This is a huge gap, but I, I even can't um, count on the drugs that have been, that, uh, that have been treated with patients uh, by this way, actually. By myself, I have like every, every Monday I have an appointment day, so I have like five, five patients who actually apply for, for this fund. So, uh, I think this is a very good, um, very good opportunity to everybody, and it, it clearly shows that uh, doctors and patients work together for for better life and the quality of life, actually, for patients. So it's uh, it's actually it's it's it comes from patients, as we know, and uh, I think it's 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 good to know that we have it, and none of the Baltic countries have it yet. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, area that you just brought out. I understand that you provide also medical companies as a patients to take, uh, who can participate in, in a drug uh, studies. We don't recruit. We don't. Recruit. You don't recruit, but but uh, in in that regard, for instance, it's a pool global, that is possible. It's a global level. What we do. Let me elaborate, yeah. and then you can continue with the question. I think yeah. there's another part. 
we, uh, we want to make sure that the patients are aware of what clinical trials are ongoing and what is our, as an organization, opinion, whether it's a good clinical trial to join or not to join. Mm -hmm. Because we also have the scientific experts within our organization who can say whether the protocol makes sense, whether you know alternative is good or bad. And actually, for the good trials, we just encourage patients to go. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and especially because access is a problem, you know, if you yeah. cannot get it otherwise and it could save your, uh, your life, but maybe side effects will be terrible, we will say maybe don't go to this one, but there's another one which is uh, much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah okay. that abolishes my question actually, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, uh, one uh, topic uh, also from this discussion, access to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. This is a problem in Estonia. I don't know how about uh, Lithuania. Yeah. How, how do you think, uh, Annika maybe, or America, Siri, how do you think we could change it in Estonia? No, ma võin... Yeah. <laughs> tege, et, tegelikult meil on päris palju selle 12 aasta jooksul, mis ma olen vähiraviga tege, no, sellest sees olnud päris palju edasi arenenud. Ja miks ma selle teemakõldse tegelema hakkasin, sellepärast, et teised ei satuks, et ma saaksin aidata inimesi, et nad ei sapkuta, satuks samadesse aukudesse, kuhu mina sattusin. Ja, ja üks, mis on nagu hästi oluline, ma osalesin ka vähiravi patsiendi teekonna disainim, seal see kestis kaks aastat ja me tegime koos sotsiaal, sotsiaalministeriumi Innove ja regionaalaigla ka sellise suure projekti, mis sai ka disainiauindadel esikoha ja seal tuli see välja, et patsiendid kõige avatavamad on just siis, kui, kui nad ootavad seda diagnoosi. Ja selle diagnoosi saamise küll oleks hea, kui oleks selline tugivõrgustik. Miks ma olen nii vaimustanud sellest palliatiivravist, sest palliatiivravi keskus võiks olla iga haigla juures ja arst võiks suunata selle patsiendi kohe sinna sotsiaaltöötaja juurde, kes selgitab välja tema võimalused, kas ta saab saaremalt Tallinnasse, kas ta saab Narvas Tallinnasse, kas tal on võimalus endale parukat osta, et teate ka need parukad ja need abivahendid maksavad väga, väga palju ja näiteks me, ma ühingus leian võimalusi, et vähekindlustavad inimestele neid tasuta anda, sest et on selliseid juhuseid olnud, kus patsient ütleb, et ma ei tule ravile, ma surem parem väärikalt, sest ma ei jõua seda parukat osta. Need on nii väiksed asjad, mille midagi me saaksime aidata ja see on just see, et sotsiaaltöötaja, kogemusnõustaja, et see vahe oleks selline väike ja et, et arst suunaks ta nende teiste inimeste juurde ja, ja tal oleks kogu aeg mingi tegevus ja siin ravimitest siin eelkõnele jätted. Kas te teate, et Eestis on, et uus ravimi uuaks inimesi nii viis aastat tagasi, see oli üle 900 päeva. See on üle kolme aasta. Nüüd on see vähenenud kuue, üle 600 päeva. See on väga suur, väga suur aeg. Ja, ja et seda nagu muuta, et Eesti on nii väike, et me saaksime äkki ravimi uuringutes osaleda koos Põhjamaadega. Näiteks laste arstidel on koostöö, see kogukond on väike, aga see koostöö on väga, väga hea neil. Näiteks meie Eesti lapsi saadetakse Taani kiiritusravile, et see rohkem koostööd ja rohkem hoolivust ja see ongi see, mis, mis aitab. Meil on tegelikult need kompetentsid asjad olemas, ainult, et siin on need, et kuidas juhtida seda patsienti nende, nende tegevusteni, et ta ise on nii stressis, et ta ise ei pöördu. Me arvame, et ta on tark patsient, et ta teab, et tuleb pöörduda, et minna vaimse tervise õe juurde või, või et minna sinna lümfiterapeud juurde. Tegelikult on ta nii šokis, et ta ei, et ta ei tea. Ta ei, teda keegi peab juhendama ja sellepärast ongi need kogemusnõustajad ja õdenõustajad ülioluline, et, et keegi haitaks teda patsienti, võtaks tal käest kinni ja ütleks, et lähme sealtukses sisse, nüüd lähed sinna ja andma neid juhiseid. Inimesele, inimestele meeldib raskes olukorras täita korraldusi ja see, see aitaks ka seda, meil Eestis on hästi palju alternatiiv meditsiini poole pöördujaid ja miks nad pöörduvad? Just sellepärast, et see auk seal on nii pikk. No, Ka minul on selline asi olnud, et tehti kompuuter, ootan, ootan, vastust ei tule, siis mõtlen, nii, nüüd keegi ei julge mulle öelda, järelikult on asjad nii alvasti. Ja see vahe, see inimene genereerib, mis iganes sellel ajal ja siis ongi oluline, et tal oleks need tugi isikud, et see ei pea arst olema, et õde 
sotsiaaltööta ja psühholog ja, ja palliatiiv ravi on üliololine, et palliatiiv ravi ei ole ainult suri ja ravi, meil vähe seletatakse seda lahti, et aga tegelikult võivad see ei ole ainult vähiaigetele, see on kõigile rasketele aigetele, aga sealt saab väga palju nõu ja abi, et inimesed pöörduge rohkem ja vaadake seda palliatiiv ravi vilmi ka, et see on... Kindlasti, nii, abi. doktor Lane. Ja aitäh, tere, Edvard Laane, kuures sõra õiglast. Me saad võibolla märkusena kinnitanud, et oletame meelde, et umbes kümme aastat tagasi või umbes sellisel ajal, ja kümme aastat tagasi oli suur konverents või ehi konverents ka palliatiiv ravist ja, ja seda siis vedas Põhja-Eesti regionala õigla seda päeva ning see oli öelda, et olid Hollandi külad, külased Hollandist, kes väitsid, et palliatiiv ravi hakkab siis peale esimesest päevast, kui aige saab diagnoosi et see ei ole midagi aige lõpus või aige alguses. Aga miks ma seda räägin, on see, et kui me tõsti tahame seda, et aige jõuaks pelatiiv ravini, siis oma ikkagi terviklikku süsteemi ja ma olen juba meeskonna juhti kaptenituma ja et laev üksi seal ei hulbi. Meil on kuskil mere peal, et meil on ju väga tugev vähi ühing tegelikult saaremal, väga tubli, väga aktiivne, aga see on vaja meeskonna kaptenit ja selleks on ikkagi onkolo karst, et ärme seda palun ära unusta et kui me soovime, et, et Eestis täiesti õiged jõuaksid nii-öelda palliatiiv ravin ja kõikid nende vajalike teenuste, nii siis oma onkologi koha peale, et see ei toimu niimoodi, et kuskilt võtta see telefon, keegi kuskilt nii-öelda lepib midagi kokku ja siis on kuskilt tuleb õde välja ja siis tuleb teine nõuste välja ja kogu süsteem töötab, nii see süsteem ei töötab. Et kui täiesti soovitakse palliatiiv ravi seda nii-öelda teenuste kätte saadavust, siis oma ka spetsialiste koha peale. I think, Laks, on I, I, selle peale, see on, see on ülioluline, et arst annab need juhised ja arst on see pealik. Yeah. I, I think there was a question to Annika also, uh, how was this palliative care organized in France? And then, of course, I would love to come back to this clinical trial. So if you could comment your uh, opinion and experience, why is it important to have access to clinical trials and how could we really change the situation here in Estonia now? Because we know that the early access is really important. Yeah, maybe first about the, there are two questions, I had a look at the questions on the board, uh, one about uh, the family members' uh, possibility to be together with a patient, mm -hmm. um, and I would say that it was excellently organized, that, that in a system in France everybody welcomed family members wherever in the facility. I was going to a hospital of kids, like on a daily basis, like three different hospitals, I mean, we were always welcome there. We always got smiles. I mean, there was a positive feeling in a very sad place, to be said. But we, we had a feeling that there is a hope, there is some laughter, yeah. there is some kind of human touch and sensibility and empathy. And it was also in the emergency room when my husband was taken away because of a brain edema um, to the uh, emergency um, uh, room. I could be there with him 24-7. So, because he didn't need to be surgery operated at the, uh, at the same time or at once, I was a company, allowed to accompany until he was taken to the, to basically to the stationary care, to, to it, taken to the uh, surgery. So it was, it was a very kind of family-friendly attitude, and they understood that family is affected by this disease as much as a patient is actually. So it was maybe the explanation. I, I didn't have a similar experience in Estonia because we, isn't, we just didn't experience that treatments. Uh, but as far as I had the experience uh, in Estonia, we also were in dialogue with uh, the oncologist. Uh, we were welcomed uh, by the doctor as a family, so it was not somehow uh, difficult. Um, and you also asked about the trials. Oh, I did a lot of research myself. I went to the world uh, websites, what are the existing trials for known small cell with uh, uh, kind of type um, um, uh, adenocarcinoma at the time. And I figured out that uh, even if I could find uh, the, the tri uh, trial, there was no chance to get into that. So, and, and in Estonia, there were no possibilities at all. So I was following that over two years when we moved to France. But um, we also were consulted by the doctor there, 
uh, commenting, I asked about what about the trials, is there any more chance? Because there are two uh, targeted therapies which actually worked for some time, and then basically in one day cancer goes wild, there is a mutation, there is no targeted therapy, and then they said there are actually no, no trials because the research is just not so far yet. At least they got an answer, but I tried to find the trials, but without success. Yes, this is something that we have to also, as a community, we as a doctor, as researchers, and you, as the patients and patient representatives, think how can we actually organize it in a such small countries, because you're a bit bigger than us, but we all together still very small, and we don't attract pharma companies, and we don't have really funding also for academic trials, and this creates inequalities for our patients, because we know that it's, it's a core standard for cancer center to have a specific number of clinical trials ongoing because already some patients can benefit without knowing the results at this, that point. Just benefit from the, uh, from the participation and this is, this is the system how we can provide early access to, to our patients also. This is, I think, something that we have to think about also. But now, since the time is, uh, time is flying, if you all had to recommend uh, one thing for uh, 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 national authorities, healthcare authorities, to change the current situation. What would actually this be? I can start. Yes, please. In every decision <laughs> which concerns cancer, cancer patients, cancer patients must be consulted. So, if it's a working group on something regulating on whatever new guidelines on breast cancer involve patients, if it's a law about how the hospital will, uh, funding will increase, will be reorganized, I don't know, involve patients. If you are discussing within the hospital how you're organizing here, involve patients. It will not happen overnight. It will not mean that you will get uh, easy task, but it is the only right way to do it. And it's not Lithuanian experience, it's the experience of every Western democracy to do it. If you are not doing it, you are creating more problems for the future. And if you need help, we are here to help. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I would add on this because now we are dealing with how to see many institutions are doing this just for the tick that we involved them, mm -hmm. that we are doing this on the final stage when we already had a decision drafted, we send it for our comments, but we do not know the source why it's drafted in this way, what's the expectations, we just read the document. And that when we are meaning, we are wanting to be there from the beginning. When you are starting discussions, when we are elaborating the decision, you have to invite at this stage us because we can, we can help you to shape the better decision from the very beginning. So I would agree. Yes, Siri? I would say the same more involvement and we have to make sure that uh, we involve uh, uh, patients and uh, patients uh, loved ones um, i'm sorry i have to switch back to estonia et ja ma kirjutan sellele kahe käega alla et me peame kaasama kaasama patsiente nende lähedasi ja me peame väga väga kindlustama selle et kui me kaasame patsiente siis me kaasame nii täiskasvanud patsiendi kui ka vähidiagnoosi saanud lapse lähedased yeah. seal on väga väga suured erinevused millised millised probleemide raskused ravidel tekivad mm -hmm. Merike, see üks soovitus. Ja et äh, olen näinud, et laste aiglas väga hästi see toimib vanemaid kaasatakse ja kutsutakse ka tõlk ja küsitakse, et kas te saate aru. Mm -hmm. Tegelikult on see keele probleem ka meil venekeelsete ja eestikeelsete patsientidega, kui arst ja õed räägivad eri keelis, keeles, siis on see ka meil praegu väga suur probleem. Nii nagu enne Mannika ütles, et ta käest küsiti, et kas te saite aru. Meie peame siin ka küsima, vene patsient tihti peale ei saa aru, ta ei julge öö Öelda, ta on vana inimene, ta ei julge öelda, et ta ei oska hästi keelt ja ta ei saanud arstist mitte midagi aru. Et mõelgem selle peale, see keele barjäär raskes olukorras inimestel on oluline, oluline. Et see on nagu kultuuri küsimus, ja. kaasamise kultuuri küsimus. Ja, ja terve hulk on siin tegelikult sellised no, väga nii. häid kommentaare, mida me ka arstid enam väga tahaks. 
Me tahaks, et meil oleks väga palju rohkem ja. üde koordinaatoreid, üde nõustajaid, meditsiinilogistikuid, et meie saaks teha arstitööd, eks ole, ja kogu selle töö, mis ei ole tingimata arstitöö, anda siis teistele spetsialistidele, et kuidas seda teha, et see on võibolla meie siuke järgmine suur väljakutse jällegi ka kõik koos. Olen teinud ammu, ammu ettepaneku, et arstil peaks olema assistent, kes sisestab, kes kirjutab, et see sisestamistöö, kas, kas siis diktafoni või igasugustes palju, tähendab paljudes ametites, mis ei ole sugugi nii vastutus tund, nii vastutus rikkad, kui on arsti amet, on inimestel assistentid ja arstil peaks olema assistent. Väga kerge on leida hästi kiirelt kirjutavat noort inimest, kes kõik selle dokumenteeriks, et arstil jääks aega inimesele silma vaadata, tema ka rääkida, teda jõustada ja, ja see, see annaks palju, palju paremat tulemus. Ja, kui on minu arvates, et kes selle kinni maksab, annika palun. Ja ma olen töötanud, ma ei siin asutus arvutanud, öeldanud, ma ei saa lupada seda. On fakt. Ja... Maybe you can switch to English then. Aga miks? Miks? This is a different discussion, maybe yeah. out of this space, but basically I would say that artificial intelligence will do a job and technology yeah. will do it much better than any human uh, in, in very coming years. Uh, but my advice or, or the biggest wish, as the moderator asked, would be to focus on communication, train patients, train doctors from the university. Uh, it is a very practical skill. And, um, and you could ask the specific questions to make sure that there is a connection and understanding. And because this is the big, let's say, um, enabler of taking responsibility and, and also be engaged in the treatment with, with a full knowledge. So this would be my, my, my biggest uh, wish that would could happen. And but, it is but, from the both patient yeah. sides uh, and also from the, the medical professional sides. Now, this is a bit of a provo- provocative question, maybe, for uh, Can I answer this before you go to the question yes. on, on this communication? Yeah. Uh, so, example is exactly what you say. We identified that it's the, the critical area to focus on both sides, because also in Lithuania, healthcare professionals are not being taught any communication in the, throughout the university years. Before COVID, we did organize a series of trainings for healthcare professionals, so not just the doctors, but nurses, etc., and patients. I don't know how many weekends it was, but it was a, a program, I don't know, 80 hours or something, uh, maybe 50 healthcare professionals and 100 patients on, on communication. For, uh, this is what we organized as a program, the, what we recorded, and what we then heard from the now graduated, uh, uh, then young uh, students, now graduated doctors, from maybe then doctors to now heads of uh, hospital institutions, that they loved that program so much, and they would want to take this as an ongoing learning, but of course, the limitation, and in university program, we can't think out of how to allocate even more credits or squeeze credits it's in all of the very robust agenda to do there. So it's, it's natural that this is a soft skill. Communication is a soft skill. And as you have this continuous medical education, I think that's how you call, I think it should be a priority topic uh, on many other soft skills that you would be learning on. And it is an ongoing journey. Uh, but that is what we received the feedback from the doctors. It was useful to understand what we can do, also understand different perspectives for the patients as well. I, I really have to add here to as, as a doctor by myself that uh, in Estonia we are in, in this very tough situation that we all need more communication. We can all understand that, even doctors understand it very well. But still we have time limits. We still have time limits and, and it is due to the finances, it is due to the resources. So if we can all we together focus on that, that let's communicate more, let's have more time. Not just more, better. It doesn't uh, have to be it, more, it can be better, know, more it, efficient. Yeah, but you, you know, we have 15 minutes. Yes, I so, know. So it's, it's kind of a yes, no questions only. <laughs> and, and that's it, so, so no, no discussion. So it's, uh, it's something that we really have to do together. Uh, but I, I have a question, all of you in the audience uh, also and here. Uh, do you know that Estonia has Estonia's cancer plan? Have you, have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Have you seen European cancer plan, Eurospeeding cancer plan? Yes. Have you read it? Yes. 
what do you think? How, how many topics from there are for patients and, uh, and for civil society and, and for organizations that could help to improve medicine and cancer care? What do you think? Can you be involved in that somehow, Sarunas? I can answer every topic includes for <laughs> patients at European level. Every topic in Europe is beating cancer plan and there's also Europe cancer mission. And that means, this is what Neringa spoke about, the EU funding that we mean, it's not the funding at national level that you compete, it's the funding that European level you compete with, with the European consortium. So the Brussels, the, the Hadea institution decides who is getting it. And this is how a number of Apollo projects are being funded. So yes, this European dimension is, uh, let me rephrase. I, I would say that now is a golden time for oncology in Europe. Uh, more money than you could think of, more uh, po potential synergies that you can act on, more political will than ever, but this will end in, in a number of years. Three, five, I don't know. But after a decade, the shift will be somewhere else. And now, either as an Estonia, same as Lithuania, I will leapfrog, uh, leapfrog from our current status of how the cancer systems are organized to more closer to what is a Western standard, or we miss this opportunity, that means we fall even further apart because the Western healthcare systems keep progressing. If we stagnate, that means we are walking backwards. The gap increases. That's the same problem in Lithuania. We do what we can with that, but we are not, we are not orchestrators of all healthcare systems, and I think you should act on this as in Estonia. Uh, yes, actually, it was quite a similar question uh, for me. Uh, we know that you have been involved within European levels, but how about Estonian uh, patient representative? Because, in a way, you have the power. If I go to the minister and tell them that we want this and that, they say that we don't have money and try to manage for yourself somehow and try to use IT and, and uh, give uh, tasks to nurses. But you are in a way the end users. <laughs> so what do you think? What's your role? How could you collaborate and uh, communicate? And uh, this should not be the end. This should now be the start, starting point of something, maybe. Uh, because uh, uh, to, uh, before we met, it seems that most, quite some of you haven't met before. So, uh, what would be your plans for the future to help to solve also us and also for you all these uh, things that we have actually been talking about now here to upgrade the current situation? Yes. It, um Asjad on palju paremaks läinud mm -hmm. ja sellepärast mul on väga hea meel ja ka minu osa on olnud selles, et, et need asjad on paremaks läinud, et meie kõigi kohus on aidata ja kus viga näid, näed, siis, siis sellele tähelepanu juhtida. Et kui mina sain ravi, siis väga paljud asjad ei olnud tasuta näiteks, kuna mul on geneetiline vähk, siis taastusravi ja kõik tollel ajal olid tasulised. Tänapäeval elu on väga palju edasi läinud. Neid, neid aigekassa, tervisekassa kompenseerib rindade taastusse aige, aige rinna. See oli väga kallis operatsioon seda, see ja see taastamine ja nüüd on see meie Eesti patsientidele tasuta. Siis toteeritakse rinnaproteesidest osaliselt ka, mis on väga suur edasiminek, siis need meie sõeluuringud, need on üliolulised, need, on, need aitavad ja päästavad väga paljud inimeste elu, et need on väga head asjad ja, ja kuidas veel paremaks saab täpselt nii, et on arst on pealik ja boss ja valib endale sinna meeskonna ja, ja ma leian, et, et see assistendi teema mul ikkagi kipitab sellepärast, et see, see aitab arste nii palju, see ei pea olema meditsiinilise aridusega inimene, see on, seda on palju odavam palgata ja ta saab teid väga palju aidata, ta saab teie töö, osa teie tööst ära teha, ta saab patsiendi kõhendust võtta, ta saab elistada, ta saab dokumenteerida, ta saab patsiendi juhendada ja, ja teie aeg tegelikult vabaneb ja te saate nagu, paremini patsiend ja ennast 
nii-öelda, teenindada, teil, on, teil oleks pare, palju parem, see oleks teie huvides ja see ei ole kallis tööjõud, see on meditsiinitöötajad, on, neid ei ole turul ja need on kallis tööjõud, aga tehniku assistente, tehnilist te- assistenti on võimalik leida ja kui arst loob endale meeskonna, kus on arst, sotsiaaltöö, näiteks onkolog, minu ideaalis oleks see nii, arst onkolog vaatab endale sotsiaaltöötaja, kogemusnõustaja, Ja, ja tal on tehniline assistent ja see meeskond tannab korraldused ja need suhtlevad tema patsientidega, hoiavad neid patsiente nii-öelda kogu aeg pildis. Ma usun, et, et see aitaks palju patsiente. Võibolla ma olen liiga idealistlik, aga see on minu nagu, unistuste maa. Ja Siri, mis oleks sinu üks nõuanne või selline soovitus? Ma ei tea, riigile haiglata ja. tervisöötehnuse osa. <laughs> riigile üks soovitus kindlasti on see, et ma ei tea, mitte ühtegi patsientiorganisatsiooni, räägime siis ainult näiteks vähipatsientide esindusorganisatsioonidest, kes ei tahaks kaasa rääkida, kes ei tahaks probleeme adresseerida või lahendusi pakkuda. Täna maakondlikud organisatsioonid Saarema näitel toimetavad selliselt, et meie aasta eelarve on 600 eurot. Ja me tahame osaleda, me tahame osaleda töögruppides, et anda, anda sinna parem sisend. Me soovime esindada patsiente, kes meie poole pöörduvad. Me peame arvestama sellega, et Saarema elaniku sissetulek on... Eesti teiste maakondadega võrreldes tagant teisel kohal, mis tähendab, et me väga palju näeme vaeva selleks, et, et võimaldada meie naistele tasuta parukaid ja kehavälised rinnaprotteese. Me tahame kaasa rääkida ravideekondade kaardistamises. Me, me peame teine kord lahendama ravimeeskonna ja patsiendi vahele tekivaid ainult kommunikatsiooniprobleeme. See ressurss on nii piiratud. Et, et ma ei näe, kuidas nii piiratud ressursiga oleks võimalik väga efektiivselt erinevatel tasanditel kaasa lüüa. Et natukene takardame me praegu siin, et meie patsientiorganisatsioonid on tegelikult ikkagi väga tugevalt alarahastatud. Kus see raha peaks tulema? Keeruline öelda. Väga keeruline öelda arvestades seda, kui vähe Eesti täna saab investeerida tervisoidu üldiselt. No jälle, eks? Tervisoodi ei ole kunagi kulu, see on alati investeering, et see on valikute küsimus. Kas me tahame saada võimalikult head sisendid nendelt inimestelt, kellega me tegeleme, ehk et patsientidelt on ju, või, või me ei taha? Kas, kas ma lihtsalt küsin su käest, et, et no erinevaid no finantsiskeeme on erinevaid, kas, kas näiteks raha peaks tulema riigilt, kas see peaks tulema oma valitsused, kas see peaks tulema, et patsientid ise peavad oma organisatsiooni üleval, kas need peaksid olema näiteks aiklate juures, me rääksime palju üks kuressere aiglast näiteks, et, et kuidas su nägemus on? Minu nägemus on, et selleks, et patsiendid oleksid võimalikult kaasatud, võiks raha tulla ikkagi riigilt ja riik teostab ju tervisoidu läbi kohaliku omavalitsuse nii kui nii. Et, et me kirjutame selle kohaliku omavalitsuse eelarves ja kohaliku omavalitsus küsib selle ikkagi riigilt näiteks on ju. Haiglates ma küll ei läheks seda raha küsima, kui kuni ei ole just tegemist ainult ühe disipliini põhise haiglaga, et see ei... See Haigla eesmärk on natukene teine, eks? Et, et võibolla jah, kui me räägime sellest, et ennetus muutub üha olulisemmaks ja, ja, ja meile kasvavad järjest peale põlvkonnad, kellel puudub igasugune regulaarne tervisekontrolli harjumus, aga ikkagi jah, et esimene selline hea idee on see, et, et riik võiks rahastada patsientorganisatsioone ja patsientiorganisatsioonid väga hea meelega selle vabanenud ajaressursiga, mis meil muidu kulub näiteks projektide kirjutamiseks, me saame anda sisendi sinna, kus seda palju rohkem vaja on. This is a quite nice final conclusion, because our time is going to end soon. If you, I think we have a time for one or two questions. Would you have any, uh, any questions also from now, from the patient representative part? The patient part, everything is clear. But do you have a plan? How should we move from here? Kohe saab doktor Lanega. How should we move from here on? Would you plan a gathering together or uh, unite in a way like Paula has uh, done in Lithuania? So you would have more power 
to, uh, to address these issues, maybe even this that you raised up, the, the, the financing. If there's just one small patient group, maybe you would not have uh, enough power, but if you're all together, you might make, make a change. So this is, this is maybe our uh, message from, uh, I'm a doctor. <laughs> so uh, in a way, we started this, um, but uh, this is for you to think how you would love to or, or like to uh, move from here. And there's also call for international collaboration or Baltic collaboration, how you as uh, Baltic uh, patient representatives could collaborate uh, and address the problems uh, of the patients of small countries, because we are Eastern European small countries. So you share some common problems, each has the, the uh, strengths and the opportunities, I think you could share a lot, and again together in a European level you, you, you could have a larger voice also. So Dr. Edward Laune, the floor is yours for the final comment. Ja, aitäh, ja ma kuulsin seda kommunikatsiooni küsimus siin või nagu läbivalt, et see suhtlumine ja... Suhtlemine ei aeg, et tõesti, kui mina on ülikoolis ka kommunikatsiooni või suhtlemist patsientidega, see oli suhteliselt teise järgunine, et tänapäeval minu mõelest mingid kursused on olemas, aga tegelikult on sellel ju lahendus olemas, kui jälle tahetakse lahendus leida, et eile kuulsime Rootsi muutusi õppes, et nendel on jõudse baasõppe ja siis tuleb vist residentuuri õppe sinna otsa. Ja tegelikult ma arvan, Euroopas igal erialal on need oma kurikulumid või õppegavad olemas. Ja nii ka ematoloogias on olemas ja seal on viimane seksioon, see suurem seksioon on üldised teadmised. Üldised teadmised, mis siis kaasab seda, kuidas läbi viia kliinised uuringuid, kuidas suhelda patsendiga, kuidas suhelda omakristega, kuidas suhelda oma vahel, kuidas on need elulõpu teemad, et kõik need on seal sees. Et Tartu inimesed, kes on dekanaadile lähemale, et siis on palve edasi viia, et ka resentuuri annab ümber korralda selliselt, et näiteks kuu aega või kaks kuud oleks sellist paas kursused. Olemas kõikidele residentidele, nad läbiksid siis enne nii-öelda põhiõppe, et kas siis kaks kuud, kolm kuud, neli kuud, kuidas keegi otsustab, aga need saab täiesti vabalt ilma igasuguse, ma arvan, suurema, suurema nii-öelda probleemite sisse viia, kui on väegi tahtmist. Aitäh. And if you tell to the uh, faculty uh, authorities that we need this, please find four hours, three times four hours. This is also work that can be maybe done. So I think we had a really nice discussions here. Uh, and uh, I thank you all for coming. And uh, I would now repeat myself, I hope this is a beginning. So I hope you all meet all together and think uh, how you would uh, plan the future to help also us <laughs> as the doctors to find these uh, solutions because everybody has his own ideas and points of views and if you put them all together I think we, we can make uh, all these things better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ma viimase repliigi ütlen, et siin oli kommentaar, et ta, miks ma ütlen, et arst peab olema boss. Arst peabki olema boss ja peab, sest tema võtab vastutuse ja tema loob oma meeskonna ja tema ongi boss. Võime siis öelda juht, kes kes selle asja peab nagu, enda, enda järgi tegema. Et siin pole midagi äbeneda. Kõik juhid valivad endale sellised töölised, kellega neil on hea koostööd teha. Ma, ma arvan, et selles osas on eri, erisus. Et võimalikud ja, ja oluline on see, et see oleks juhitud, et selle oleks koostöö ja et selle oleks ikka partnerlus ja, ja jagatud vastutus ka, eks ole sellepärast, et, et seal sinna juurde tuleb see informeerimine. Okei, okay, thank you all. Thank you so much for your time. And, and, uh, and I hope we, we all, all can take something from here home. Yes, we have to go now. <laughs> ja, ja minu poolt siis ka Eesti arstide päevade korralduskomiteest või, või korraldusmeeskonnast, et suur aitäh teile järjekordsete juubeli arstide päevade päevadel osalemisest. Ma arvan, et te nautisite. Ma arvan, et me tekitasime jälle teis seda kihku tulla järgmine aasta juba tagasi. Hetkel ma jään vastuse võlgu, mis linnasse saab olema. Aga aitäh teile osalemast. Aitäh kogu meeskonnale, kellega me siin toimetasime. Ja tere tulemast aasta pärast, nii et ma võin teid juba ette hoiatada, et meil on juba järgmiseks aastaks mõned plaanid valmis.